Welcome to the Lore Sworn War College Hearts of Iron 4 video on politics and government. When we click on the flag for your country, we can see the German Reich you just inherited is currently ruled by uh, some guy with a mustache. I don't really know who he is, but I've heard he's kind of a big deal. He's currently giving us plus 50% political power gain, and various historical leaders will give different bonuses like this. We also currently have two national spirits, Bitter Loser, which makes it harder for us to drift away from our fascist ideology, and General Staff, which gives better organization to our divisions and helps us plan wars faster. Our current ruling party is fascist, although there is support in our country for democracy and communism, if we decide we want to go that way and switch over. We can gain new national spirits and in fact replace our leader by taking various actions, a lot of which are tied up in the national focus tree. Check out the video on that for more. Now, your government runs on political power, which we're currently gaining two of per day, and could be gaining one more if we decided to pause progress on our national focus. This is used for hiring government ministers and changing our laws. At the beginning of the game, we have limited conscription as our conscription law, which gives us 2.5 recruitable population and no other bonuses. Some countries like the US start with disarmed nation, which give them even lower recruitable population. As the war progresses, we can pass stricter conscription laws, which give us more manpower to work with, but also increasing penalties, such as requiring longer to train divisions and eventually reducing our factory output, since we're throwing everybody out of their normal jobs and onto the front lines. The second thing you can change is your trade laws. Currently we're on limited exports, which means 25% of our strategic resources such as tungsten, aluminum, and steel are currently unavailable to us because they're being traded on the open market. In return, we get increased factory output, construction time, and research time. Free trade is the most liberal of these laws, which will greatly reduce the amount of resources you have to work with, but also give you the largest bonuses. And closed economy means anything within your borders will be usable only by you, but you won't get any of the benefits of having a market economy. Finally, we have the mobilization law. Germany starts with partial mobilization, meaning 20% of their civilian factories are being used for consumer goods, and it increases construction speed and conversion costs for factories. Civilian economy is the least mobilized and strictly limits how many of your factories can be used for war-relevant production. Ideally, you always want to progress from civilian economy to early mobilization to partial mobilization up to war economy, which is kind of the sweet spot, where most of your consumer good factories have been put toward the war effort and aren't building microwaves or newspapers or whatever all those draft dodgers are consuming these days and greatly increases your construction speed. There may come a time that you have to go to total mobilization. This maxes your factory output, but also decreases your recruitable population by 3%, as you're having to send more men back from the front lines to man all these new factories. Each of these laws costs 150 political power to move one step away on the continuum from where you currently are, and significantly more than that if you want to jump straight to the most extreme version in comparison to what you're at right now. You also use political power to hire government ministers that each give some sort of bonus to your nation over time. The political advisor category is particularly significant because you can hire fascist demagogues, communist revolutionaries, and democratic reformers if you want to change the ethos of your government and start a new faction or join a different one from the one you're currently inclined to. You can use these ministers, for example, to make a democratic Soviet Union, a fascist United States, or even a communist Germany, which is a great way to have a fun ahistorical playthrough. You can also use it to hire industrial firms, material designers, aircraft designers, ship designers, and tank designers that each give specific bonuses to their particular purview. Now the next thing we're going to show off is diplomacy. You can right click on a country to bring up the diplomatic menu. As you can see, Hungary is another fine fascist nation 
that already has an opinion bonus with us, and vice versa because of our shared ideology. Eventually you'll want to invite other like-minded nations to your faction. Currently we can't because neither of us are at war, and we haven't overcome their base reluctance. But we can spend political power, once we have enough, to start improving relations and getting on the way to making friends. The screen is also used to justify war goals. Much like other Paradox games, we just can't go to war with whenever we want. We have to actually justify a war goal first. Currently, it's going to take us 50 political power and the better part of a year to go to war with Poland. But luckily, we have a national focus that lets us bypass this. And also, once the war kicks off, fascist nations get a huge reduction in the amount of power and time it takes to justify a war goal against a new nation. And finally, we have the trade screen. If we go to our production tab, we can see that we currently are missing a lot of oil and rubber, which we need for our production lines to run at full efficiency. The best way to get this in the early game is trade, although this becomes a bit harder when war breaks out, the democratic nations no longer want to trade with you, and the UK decides to blockade your entire coastline. At that point, you'll need to start seizing resources from other nations by capturing their territory to make up for the trade deficit. Sorting by influence, which affects how willing they are to give us their goods versus other people competing for the trade, it looks like fascist Venezuela has a lot of oil that they're willing to ship to us. We won't necessarily be able to get it from them once we go to war with the Atlantic powers, since convoys do have to transport the resources to us. But for now, it looks like we can go ahead and set the amount that we need to buy to fill all our current resource needs. We'll give them three civilian factories worth of production, meaning we won't be able to use those three factories for the length of the trade deal, but in return, we won't be running an oil deficit anymore. So let's do the same thing for rubber. It looks like France has quite a bit that they're willing to give us, which won't necessarily happen once we declare war on them, but shortly after that, we're going to annex their asses. So they'll give us the rubber willingly now and at gunpoint later. Also keep in mind that overseas trade requires convoys, a special type of boat built using naval dockyards that can be destroyed by submarines or other naval battles. If you run out of convoys, your overseas trade will stop and your resource shortages will return, so it's good to always be producing some to keep in your stockpile to make up for the ones that are getting sunk. That's all you need to know about government trade and politics. Now you can check out one of our other videos, such as the one on technology, national focuses, production and logistics, or one of our more advanced ones, such as planning and executing wars.